Governor, thank you for joining us this afternoon. I know you condemned the president's rally, but realistically, what can be done when he says he doesn't figure that he is subject to this uh, pandemic rule of no more than 50 people? Well, I don't know how in the world he could possibly think he's not subject to the same rules that everybody else is subject to. These are not rules that we just put in place on our own. These came as a result of weekly meetings we have with the uh, vice president's council, you know, with all the governors around those phone calls, the CDC, FEMA's involved with that. When you're a red county, which we were for a long time, the, the limit was 10. Then if you're yellow, it's 25. We've doubled that and made it 50 to give people an opportunity to get together. Why he feels that he's above the law, the person that claims to be the law and order president, and he doesn't have to follow it is beyond me. Nevada is such a crucial state in this election. There's bound to be other rallies. What will you do? Well, you know, each local jurisdiction has enforcement authority, as does the state have enforcement authority. I know that uh, everyone is looking at the two rallies we had, both the one in Wind Minden and the one in Henderson. Uh, what's disturbing to me is, John, people, we're, we're start, our numbers are starting to look a lot better. I mean, they're coming down, our positivity, the cases and so forth, hospitalization. Our hospitalizations are less than 50% of what they were just six weeks ago. So we're doing a lot better. That didn't come by chance. That came by every person in the state of Nevada that is participating, practicing the, the guidelines we put in place, wearing a mask, avoiding these large gatherings, uh, keeping your social distance away from people. And because people were willing to make so many sacrifices, I mean, that they couldn't go to the restaurant with 20 people and they couldn't go visit their family in a hospital, all those sacrifices that they made helped us get to where we are. And, and now one person comes with their reckless, selfish, uh, irresponsible actions and behavior and can set us back a long, long way. And that's just not fair. It's just not fair. What do you think should happen to extreme manufacturing, the host of the rally? Well, I mean, they knew what they were, they were gonna do. I mean, their own website listed that they wouldn't host any gatherings more than 10 people. You know, and then they had the, the president there with, and Don Ahern, this is his, first he had the hotel on the uh, Ahern Hotel or on the north side of Sahara there, and now this, and uh, he was notified ahead of time by the city of Henderson that he was in violation of the directives if he moved ahead with this. Now, my understanding is that the city of Henderson did take some action against him, a small fine, and uh, the state enforcement agencies still have some jurisdiction, so we're going to wait and see what they do as well. Can you understand people's frustration where if you're a football fan or a rodeo fan, you're out of luck, but if you want to go to a political rally or be down on the crowded Fremont Street experience, you're fine. It just seems like these pandemic restrictions are being followed differently. Well, they're not being followed differently, and you're absolutely right. If you're a, a football fan and you want to go, I've been looking forward to going to opening day at Raiders Stadium for three years, and you can't go next Monday. You know, that's unfortunate. I think most of the hotel properties if you're talking about on the strip or downtown, in the hotels, they've gone a long, long way towards getting compliance. People are complying. They're wearing their masks. They're not together real close. But when they go outside and they're on the sidewalk, that's not really anybody's jurisdiction. It's not the Palazzo jurisdiction or the Wynn or Caesars Palace. I mean, they don't have security out there. They don't have ambassadors out there saying, geez, yeah, you got to put on a mask or let's spread apart a little bit. That's in a public area. This is different where it's inside. Now in a casino, they have to follow these rules. They could not have had a gathering like they did at, at uh, Extreme Manufacturing in Henderson. You couldn't have done that in a casino because they'd have been putting their gaming license in jeopardy and they would never do that. Let's talk about unemployment. On Friday, FEMA approved Nevada for the lost wages program. How soon until these people get their extra $300 a week? Well, we're looking a couple of weeks out, I'm guessing three to four weeks. You know, we wish that the federal government would have had a program in place to distribute that. Uh, right now, we've already got uh, three programs that are in, are in place. We've got our regular one uh, that we've had state unemployment. We had the additional one, the $600 that expired, and then we had the PUA claims. So, you know, a lot of stress has been put on an agency and a system that simply was not set up to handle all of this. We were inundated with fraud claims, uh, just an enormous number of them. And we worked with the Department of Labor and they made it about as clear as you could possibly make it, John. If, if you give out the money to people and it's deemed to be fraudulent, the state of Nevada owes the federal government back the money. It was our responsibility solely. Now, some states had a little easier time with that. States that had income tax had a database so they could check 
the person's name against the income tax filing and find out if they were really a person that lived there, a resident, and they worked and they paid their taxes and so forth. We don't have anything like that. So Nevada was ripe for fraud and some unscrupulous folks took advantage of that, but we're working our way through it and I think we're pretty close. I know you're making drastic budget cuts up there in Carson City, but why not kick in the extra hundred bucks for these people? We don't have the extra hundred dollars. If we kicked in the extra hundred dollars, our unemployment fund has now been depleted. Uh, right at being depleted, we have to borrow more money from the federal government in order to kick in the extra hundred dollars. I mean, they're getting the, the $450 or thereabouts. They, this would bring them up the street and brings them up to $750. I'm more interested in trying to get people back to work than I am just getting more unemployment out there. Uh, certainly, we need to get the help in people's hands, but we need to do more to get people back to work and get this, uh, the economy open back up again and get tourists coming here. And they should understand that these payments are only for a few weeks. These yeah, it's just three weeks is what you're saying. Right. Yeah, it's not a long-term thing. It, it, now, it certainly helps. $900 would help anybody. But it is just for a few weeks. You're right. And the eviction moratorium now ends October 15th, and you've established a strike team to get unemployment payments into these people's hands. Will they have enough time before this October 15th date? Well, we're hopeful that they will. And we've also got uh, Clark County has approximately 40 or $50 million, and the state put in $10 million more from our CARES fund to help with uh, rent, you know, that people fall behind. Now, that money is allocated to the landlords. It's not allocated to the individual so that it, we're sure that it gets in the hand because now landlords, because we extended it, they're running into a problem. You know, they've got their payments to make mortgages and taxes and whatnot. So working to try to bundle those together and get the tenants all uh, being applied, going through one landlord and paying that out. So hopefully there'll be enough time to get it to everybody, yeah. How are those funds holding up with the rental assistance? Well, we're just beginning it, frankly, and I don't know if that's going to be enough. I believe it's $50 million, counting the last 10 that we put in. But there's a lot of people that went without for a long time, and uh, you start eating into that pretty quick when you're taking it out in, you know, three, four, five thousand dollar chunks. The Gwynn Center estimates there could be a half million Nevadans homeless by the end of the year if these programs expire. Uh, do you agree with those numbers? Well, you know, I trust the Gwynn Center. I mean, they've done a remarkable job. Uh, I guess it's possible. It's certainly unfortunate. And I commend all of our social service agencies, all including the governmental ones, but a lot of the private ones, a lot of our faith-based groups, a lot of different groups that have helped with the feeding of the with the individuals, the homeless, uh, trying to keep them into their house. We are concerned about the eviction moratorium when, it's, when it ends, if people will make that arrangement with their landlords so that then they pay and they're not uh, homeless again, but uh, it's going to be it's going to be hard if people are facing problems. Is there any talk of extending the eviction moratorium past October 15th? Well, the federal one goes until December 31st, so we're going to have to see working with the Attorney General's office and the Secretary of State to try to determine how that's going to play into ours. If it needs to be extended, if the federal one that got extended after we extended it will take control. Uh, there's a lot of unanswered questions now that the federal government stepped in. It, do you ever stay up at night wondering what all that would look like if it just, if the government didn't step in and all these people were left without a home? I, I do think about that and it would be tragic. I mean, we'd have more people living in their cars and out on the street. It's already a problem in a lot of cities. It's a problem in our bigger cities in Reno and, and Las Vegas, certainly. Uh, you just, your heart aches for the folks that are in that position. And uh, hopefully we've got it. It's a tough balancing act to get everybody handled as best you possibly can. But I think we're getting close and I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll come up with a good resolution, John. Uh, and speaking of um, education now, a lot of parents ha have expressed frustration, uh, either that their kids aren't learning or the technology just isn't keeping up with what they need. And it would, how, how realistic would it be to get these schools open after the Christmas break? Well, that's going to be up. That's another one that we left up to the school districts. We've got 17 counties in the state, 17 different school districts. And, you know, what you need in Clark or Washoe is uh, Clark is different than Washoe and Washoe is different than Esmeralda or White Pine or, or Elko. Uh, uh, everybody's different depending on the size of the population, number of students, the economy, the positivity rate of infections and so forth. It's been difficult to get a device and internet access into everybody's hands. I know that the teachers are frustrated with that. Uh, I would hope that the school boards would take more input from the parents instead of just letting the 
uh, superintendent and the, the uh, school board make the decision on their own because the parents are facing real problems, whether it's nutrition for their kids, whether it's childcare, those sort of things. And I think they need to listen to what uh, is impacting the parents the most. The testing scores, the truancy rates weren't all that great to begin with before the pandemic. Do you worry that we're going to lose some of these children permanently if we don't get them back into a structure where they can be socialized with other children? I do. I worry that, you know, a lot of them need structure. I mean, it's some kids are great. And I talk to parents, some kids are great at learning from home and, and having the independence and learning online. Some of them, it just simply doesn't work. They need to be in a structured environment. They need to have the teacher there giving them the assignment. Uh, and then you miss also the socialization. You know, you miss the, the basketball team or you miss the, the uh arts and, and crafts, you, you, you miss the theater, you miss those sort of things. So we want to get them back in there clearly. But the one thing that I can guarantee you has happened as a result of this is parents have a much, much greater appreciation of teachers than they did prior to pandemic, because they are now realizing it's not as easy as it looks like when you've got a couple of kids and you've got to educate them and do homework and lessons and planning. So there's a our teachers, our educators are just absolutely outstanding, incredible. I can't thank them enough. And they're on the front line here, and hopefully we're together. We're going to be able to come up with a plan to get us through this. And Governor Sislak, I thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Appreciate it, John. Good to see you. Take care of yourself.